Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we'll have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. Welcome back to Top Traders Roundtable, a podcast series on managed futures brought to you by CME Group, where I continue my conversation with Richard Dennis, who really don't need any introduction. But for those of you who don't know, Rich is the creator of the Turtle program and also the original mentor to my other two guests on today's show, namely Brian Proctor, a Turtle and Managing Director of EMC Capital Advisors, and last but not least, one of my own mentors when I got started in the managed futures industry many years ago, namely Jerry Parker, another turtle founder and president of Chesapeake Capital. Yeah, we had something this week that said the only inflows in hedge funds were with CTAs last year. Mm-hmm. So now yeah. I think it's another question of how large is your firm? Does your firm make me comfortable? Do you, how many PhDs do you have? It's less about the markets and performance. It's more about the, there are lots of assets coming to CTAs, but only four or five. Mm, yeah. I mean, to that point, I would, I would agree. I mean, my previous conversation for Top Traders Roundtable was indeed with three of the largest consultants in, in the world. And, and they've certainly discussed those topics as to what drives the allocations today. And uh, there, there's some surprising answers, actually. So for the listener, please do go and, and check those episodes out. I want to stay with one of the things that I think you, Brian, mentioned about the volatility. And, you know, one of the changes that I've seen occur since the days of the turtle program is that nowadays many of the highly successful ctas in terms of size have adopted sort of a constant targeting of a specific level of volatility some people go for 10 percent vol 15 percent vol products or if you really want bank for your buck you can get a 20 percent vol target product so to speak i wanted to ask you rich maybe first what do you think about this development and and should volatility be targeted in your opinion Well, I'm far from managing any money for people, so I might be not so relevant, but I've never quite understood the problem with volatility. Maybe there's some problems associated with that, but people can modify the volatility themselves to just put less money in if that's what what they're worried about. Hmm. Uh, I don't know anything about the specifics of uh, how managers are targeting things now, though. Sure. But but back then, I guess, and maybe this is a question for, for you, Jerry and Brian. So back then, when, when you started sort of uh, your own businesses after finishing the Turtle program, did you even think about volatility targeting or were you just basically taking whatever volatility that the design of the strategy gave you? So I'm pretty intense on this subject. And I think that in some ways, I have changed the least amongst the turtles but in another maybe in longer term is is maybe a very material change so i think that our approach has maintained the overall philosophy except it's just longer term and so i have no interest in the ball targeting and i just don't understand it it's not it is something i think that clients kind of want and i know better than going down that route Mm. Doing things that clients want. And I think it's just sort of a more sophisticated way of taking profits uh, before the trend reverses. So I do think that if your daily return is 5% plus or minus on average, that's too much volatility. Sure. But if I'll, for instance, risk 50 basis points on a 
trade. If I if gold goes down, I'll get out with the 50 basis points loss on my capital. But if gold, if I buy gold at 800 and it goes to 1900, I'll probably let it draw down 500 basis points until my trailing stop gets hit. So mm-hmm. I think that's just two entirely different situations and no interest in vol targeting or just it's just another way of taking profits basically sure sure sure, sure. brian do you have any strong thoughts about this or, or otherwise i'm happy to continue with a, another question well i will say back in the late 1980s when the turtle pre- program ended and we all went off on our own the risk free rate was much higher than <laughs> and the investors we were talking to wanted us to make three, four, five times the risk-free rate. So initially, they were more accepting of volatility and drawdown back then. And as those rates have come down over the years, so has the appetite for a lot of, a lot of investors out there. Mm-hmm. They want lower vol products just because it fits in with their mandates better. but And as far as reducing the volatility in, in our program, in our flagship program, we have reduced it a little bit, but not much. But we have come up and developed newer programs that have different vol targets that we can market to investors who have those kind of targets in mind. Mm. Okay. I want to stay, I think, with you, Jerry, for a little bit, but also put something into context that, that Rich mentioned about, you know, the market. So I guess back in the day, again, from, from my own experience and recollection, there seemed to have been, you know, some really extreme trends at times. And in recent years, we've probably had fewer of those, as, as Rich pointed out, and also a contraction of volatility for, for sure. So performance, as, as we've discussed, has been under a little bit of pressure for many managers. And in my conversations or episodes of, of podcasts of more than a hundred so far of with some of the most successful systematic traders and investors, if you like, there is a clear consensus that between where you enter a trade and where you exit a trade and how much risk you should allocate, the exit is usually mentioned as the most important of the three. And I guess you could argue that maybe one of the weaknesses of trend following, if it's not done well, is that you give back a lot of the open profit when the trend comes to an end and it starts reversing. So my question to you, Jerry, first is that, you know, back in the day, if you were already, you know, and you're still learning this sort of methodology, but if you were long in a market, you had substantial profits and perhaps, you know, some news came out that just made the market go parabolic for a few hours and then suddenly collapse later on in the day. Did you ever consider back then or even discuss with some of the fellow turtles or even perhaps with Rich as well, whether this was a sign that the trend was coming to an end and it was time to sort of lighten up a bit? And and if so, I mean, could this be made into fixed rules or sometimes did you have to use a bit of discretion, so to speak, in, in those in those periods? I had lots of bad thoughts that I didn't act on. I think when I was trading for Rich... I was very, eventually I got to a point where I could follow the rules and I was very intense on following those rules and doing the type of exit, entries and exits that we were taught to do. Now, once mm. you get out on your own, you maybe don't, I remember doing my first sort of trade where, I don't know what I did, but it was not maybe by the book. And I was like, oh my, this is kind of crazy because I haven't done this before. But I think that uh, I didn't really hear about, I started hearing about all of these great ideas with a sample size of 10 that people were introducing to their systems. So I pretty much was able to stay away from that. It was just mm. a few things that I just have in my head that I would ask Rich or that was, were really big in the class and sample size was one. And discretionary trading was something to be avoided and just stick with your, with your exits. Yeah. Well, what about you, Brian? Did you find it difficult at times uh, initially to to just be a hundred percent disciplined and and stay with that when you know clearly these emo you know emotions when you see you know things like that happening in the market you, you know it gets a bit tense or was it also for you sort of very much just follow the system from day one? 
Well, the great thing about the turtle program was it gave us the opportunity to learn how to trade. So maybe I was a little naive, but it just took all the psychological pressure away. We weren't risking our own money. Sure. All you had to do was follow the rules. So I I would say during the turtle program, it was it was very easy to do what you were supposed to do. I mean, you had some of the brightest uh, guys and pioneers in our business telling us this works, just do it. And when we did do it, we saw that it worked. Not to say that it wasn't painful watching <laughs> profitable trades turn into losses. And certainly when we went off on our own and started managing money, it's it's very hard to, to be, as Rich said before, consistent. You have to mm-hmm consistently do the right thing, which when you go through long losing periods is difficult. And you're inclined to to think maybe we should make some changes so I don't have to go through this again. So definitely harder when you're when we had to go off on our own. Yeah, no, of course. I want to shift gear a bit and discuss maybe some of your reflections when you think back of the on, on the turtle program. And let me start with you, Rich, again. I mean, do you have any regrets doing the turtle program now some 30 years later? Well, no, I don't have any regrets. I'm not happy with some of the people who put some stuff online and make money off it who had nothing to do with it. But no, I I think it worked out pretty well for everyone. Yeah. And what about, I mean, did you back then have you know, ex- sort of expectations that you kind of, I don't know how to phrase it, but I might, or maybe I could just ask, I mean, did, did it meet your expectations on, on all fronts or were there certain parts of it that uh, sort of surprised you? You mentioned a little bit earlier today about, you know, certain maybe people you thought were going to do well and, and didn't and, and vice versa, but anything else in terms of your expectations to it that surprised you or, or weren't met or exceeded <laughs> significantly? Well, you know, it, it, if you make enough trades, everything seems like a trade. And sort of doing this was just another piece of risk that we chose to take on. Hmm. So, you know, you make a trade, you don't really have great expectations for it or, you know, great fear. It's just one of many things you're going to do. And this was a very large trade, if you hmm. think of it that way. Yeah. Uh, and but But like with my other trades, I didn't really have – numerical targets or anything like that in mind okay okay and and what about you brian and jerry you know what what are the really the key takeaways from the whole turtle experience when you think back on those years go ahead jerry Mm, the takeaway as well i think uh, you know we learned a lot and it was just a magical time and it was those were four great years. I had no expectation of future business. We, I think we all would have been incredibly happy to continue managing money for Rich for the rest of our life. And mm. that was, you know, would have been a good idea. I think uh, some of the, a, the other guys that compete against other CTAs, in my opinion, probably did not have nearly the training and support that we had. And yet... They have fairly large businesses, and a lot of those guys went out together and worked together. And so I think that was maybe an opportunity that we kind of miss sort of most of us just going out on our own. So I'm not sure. I really wish that in some kind of crazy way we had the best training, the best experience, the best four years that anyone could ever hope for. But I don't know that I personally, I mean, I went to a good business school, even though it doesn't really look like it. Uh, And maybe part of my problem was that I sort of suggested a question for Rich because I've asked this question many times to myself. Maybe it's a little a a bad question, but maybe, you know, is is proper trading a a real business? And I think to some degree, I've tried to trade properly and not pay attention to clients as much as maybe I should have and not fall targeted and not taking profits and not made it a better experience. And I think that to some degree, that was uh, one of the turtle characteristics of uh, clients are, and others are going to lead you down the bad path. So stick with your system, stick with what you believe to be true, but maybe a little bit more compromise would have, would have made me have a, a larger business. 
Mm. Yeah. What about you, Brian? I, I would say the most important concepts and things that always resonated with me were you just have to have really strict risk management. Don't overtrade. Take lots of losing trades. Don't don't get out of your winning trades until the trend is confirmed that it's over. So I, I think risk management was ruled key concept number one, if you will. And then concept number two was uh, keep looking at new ways or new systems, blending different values together, different time frames to see if you can come up with something better than you already have. So we've invested a lot of money in our research infrastructure and we're always searching for the for the next best great system. So I think those were the two concepts that I took away from the turtle program were system development and, and risk management. Now, just going back to you, Rich, I mean, I can sort of imagine you telling Jerry and Brian and all the other turtles, you know, trade small, follow the system, do the hard thing, do the right thing and innovate and so on. But what if you were to teach a turtle program today? Would you teach them the same thing or is there anything different to what you would teach them in, in 2017? Well, I wouldn't teach the same thing. And to tell you the truth, I don't know exactly what I would teach because it's just harder to do objectively now. Now, maybe yeah. it'll get easy again. But I've thought I've, people have asked me that question. And I don't have a good answer for it. I, I don't even know if it would work again, to tell you the truth, that these exogenous variables that, yeah. that have kind of truncated trends, they're a problem. There's no doubt about it. Sure. Sure, sure. And as you know, Jerry mentioned in, in one of his responses that he and many of the turtles probably would have loved to to just stay, you know, trading for you. I mean, did you ever consider at some, you know, during that just to keep it going, so to speak, for forever? Or was it always in your mind something you would do for a period of time just to prove your point or or, or not? Well, I got to the point when we closed the turtle program that shortly after I retired for the first time um, i'm kind of like one of those uh, rock people who gives 18 <laughs> final tours okay. that, that was the first time and, and I, I just needed to stop and reassess things and i decided to go whole hog into that that halt and that was the only reason i closed it really yeah 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 jerry and brian rich mentioned before that Obviously, there are things that have made things uh, for, for trend following more difficult today. And I'm sure you've been asked this question many times by, by clients. Do you have any thoughts about sort of the this low return period that trend following has been through in the last couple of years? I mean, is this is this just part of, of trend following or is there something else going on here that, that may be a little bit more sustained as, as we look into the future? Well, I would say I'm cautiously optimistic that we may have seen the bottoms in zero to negative interest rates, although that may not be the case. It it certainly has been more difficult recently with central bank intervention and government policies that have kind of uh, dried up the liquidity in a lot of markets and and that are, I think, designed to make it difficult for professional money managers out there. But that said, there are periods where no matter what the powers that be decide, you're still going to see the price of crude oil go from $100 to $30 a barrel or other commodity markets that they that they can't control. So it's it's always a matter of being involved and taking trades and trying to identify when those next trends are coming. And if they don't come in the financial sector, then having a, a 40 or a 50% allocation to commodity markets might provide the opportunities where the other markets aren't, aren't working. Sure. Any, any thoughts from you, Jerry? I think that the markets, you know, obviously they're not trending and we're so diversified and the only thing trending is stocks, so that's a 
that's been a problem. I think in, I wouldn't necessarily call it system failure. It's just a lack of trends. But I do think that there are a few things that trouble me with the main one being the fall targeting mm. that the largest CTAs are committed to. And I do think that Dow down a thousand in August of 15 is probably related to that. CTAs were probably a major part of that. And then it does seem that when the markets do reverse, a long-term trend reverses and volatility picks up, that does, we have seen quite a few crashes, which once again is probably all of these guys trying to get out at the same time. They put a trade in because the vol has increased. They get to fill back. Vol has increased. They got to do another trade. Mm. So it's, I think that's a, a problem. Sure. When we get the trends, are we going to get the crashes? And we yeah. see those too frequently. Yeah. Yeah. I want to stay with you, Jerry, just for a second. You mentioned earlier about whether you had been too true to the turtle rules and, and that had prevented you from bigging, uh, build, building a, a, a bigger business. I wouldn't say not be even building because you did and maybe say maintaining a, a bigger business. But I want to ask a sl slightly s sort of related question to that because I think a lot of traders out there who are very, very good traders, my question is more, if you want to build a big business around a successful trading strategy, is it the strategy, so to speak, that might prevent you from doing that? Or is it in fact that maybe traders, <laughs> and don't get me wrong here, but maybe traders should stay with trading and, and, and you need to bring in business people, so to speak, to, to run the business? Because just because you're a great trader doesn't mean necessarily you're, you're a brilliant business person. Maybe a bit controversial to ask you that, but I don't know. I read some articles about <clears throat> some of the larger firms and the first investor they got mm. was someone who actually invested in the business to build yeah. out this infrastructure, create a the proper structure to have a firm that's going to raise a lot of assets and concentrate on sales alpha as much as trading alpha. Mm. Yeah. I want to shift gear again and perhaps uh, focus a little bit on R you, Rich, now as we sort of slowly start bringing our conversation to to an end. And and I want to ask you, back in 1983, 84, did, did you ever imagine, and even today, do you realize how many people's lives you have impacted in such a positive way through the Turtle program? Well, I try in a way not to know those sort of things. I, I guess at the end of the day, I know that, and I kind of I'm, I'm proud of that. But I, I just don't think self congratulation is pretty. So <laughs> I tend to try to avoid it like the plague. Right. Sure. And maybe on a on a, you know slightly different question, but if if you were 20 years today, I mean, would you would you go back to trading? I mean, is, is trading the one thing for, for you, so to speak, or, or what else would you like to, to, to do? No one will make me president, so I guess I would just keep trading. <laughs> <laughs> Although, well, I don't know. <laughs> Strange, right. Stranger people than me, if you know what I mean. <laughs> I think we all do. And what about you, Jerry and Brian? I mean, if you were 20 years today and maybe, you know, you you hadn't seen an ad in the Wall Street Journal. I mean, was trading still something you think you would have pursued or were there any other passions that you might have ended up doing instead? Well, I guess you did actually, Brian, didn't you? You took a, you did something else, didn't you as well? Well, I, I got a law degree and practiced for a boutique litigation firm in Chicago. They were good enough to hire me to work part-time. So I would come in after the trading day was done probably two o'clock in the afternoon and, and work for maybe five days a week, three or four hours. So I got to see what that was about. I, I think that's a, a realistic possibility. If I could, if, if I was, and what I'm advising my younger children now is probably to look at engineering or something like that, because that seems where the future is going. But um, you know the trading industry obviously has been a great, a great opportunity, and it's it's interesting and it's always changing. So I have no regrets. Sure, sure. 
Now, I want to ask you, Rich, a completely different question. This actually comes from one of your other students uh, in the program, someone who was curious about this. And, and the question is, back then, if you ever considered buying the Chicago Cubs in the early 80s and have the Turtles apply sabermetrics research to gain an advantage in the game of baseball? Well, that's a great idea whose time hadn't arrived by then. You know, I've owned a small part of the White Sox baseball team for almost 40 years. No, I, okay, I didn't know that. Okay, so It's a very small part. It's always been a very small part. And I'm all, for, I'm all in on sabermetrics. And it, it, it's interesting, the whole the computers and statistics and the speed of computers. It's totally changed everything in, in that sport for the, for the more intelligent, really. Mm-hmm. But... Uh, buying the Cubs, I've, I've seen too many people coming out of the park after the game, not entirely comp- compass mentis, I think is the word. So no, I didn't didn't think about mar- marrying the two. Okay. okay. Cub turtles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. As we come to an end of our conversation, I wanted to ask all of you if you would like to bring up anything with each other. I mean, perhaps you, Jerry, and Brian would have a question for your mentor and vice versa. Is there anything that that you, Rich, would like to ask Brian and and Jerry? So I'm not the only one asking all the questions today. I would ask Rich, I had heard that you had developed a number of counter trend trading models maybe 10, 15 years ago. I just was curious if if you found anything in that realm that has worked and that you continue to use. I would say almost nothing. Okay. If you find, you might find something that works, but it would trade, would trade so infrequently that I'm not sure it would. it's worth the effort to track it. I mean, it's a would be something we had a, I had a thought and it actually was a decent system but it almost never happened and it basically was real simple the, if the price of anything got down to 10 n the price you know then you, you should buy it because that, that, that was something that had been uh, was so out of whack that you could take a counter trend position but that might happen two or three times a year not enough. And on the other on the other end, say if something is so overvalued that it would be a sell. Uh, you're never going to get away with that. Uh, I think <laughs> well, it was John Maynard Keynes said the market can stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent. <laughs> That's right. Mm. What about you, Jared? Do you have a, a question for Rich as well? Mm, I can't think of anything. I'm totally drawing a blank. I'm going through my notes and I. <laughs> what about you, Rich? What about uh, a question for, for two of your turtles? Well, just let me make a comment. I really don't have a question. And it's, sure. it will be, like most of my thoughts, simplicity itself. Probably still believe the trend is your friend, but really the rules are your guardian angel. And I'm not sure which one I would rank as the first most important principle. I think it's it, it's it, it's pretty much a dead eat. Hmm. Interesting. I would say that uh, I wanted to make a comment earlier that it's shocking how much research we've done over the years, and maybe some of the nuances for entering trades or exiting trades we we got we were able to code them and actually put them make them a systematic approach. But it's shocking how little of the research we've actually implemented, and we've obviously implemented some that. In hindsight, I wish we hadn't have implemented. But another th- cost of doing research is just changing. And in some regards, it's just another derivative of not following your rules. And I, we've, I've, been, I've been really bad at that over the years of, you know, zigging when I should have just stayed the same, not even zigging when I should have zagged. I should have not changed anything. And I think that that's a, a lesson that, Another reason that the rules are so important, uh, they're important, and, you, and there's many different ways of not following them. Now, uh, once again, back to my pet peeve of this ball targeting, I think it's 
back when I used to violate the system and get out of a trade, a coffee trade too early. I remember doing that once. I knew it was wrong and I knew I shouldn't do it. And it did not prove to be a good idea. But now we're much more sophisticated in programming that bad idea. So somehow, oh, it's okay now because it's been programmed and sort of systematic discretion, counter trend philosophy just gets programmed right in. So I think I feel very comfortable with an approach that's very similar to the way I used to trade. It doesn't, you know, have these bad, some of the bad elements in it. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting you mentioned that in a sense, I guess what you're saying is that you shouldn't change too much. And, and, and another word for that would be, you know, adapt too much. And, and it's interesting because I, I saw this quote on a, on a, uh, in a paper on trend following from a, one of the very large European CTAs uh, talking about the turtle story actually quite a lot. And they, they end up by saying, and I quote, stories can be powerful, but the reality is that there has never existed a simple technical trading rule that can be applied year after year, consistently generating profits, nor a secret rule only known by a few insiders, nor a publicly available rule acclaimed by academics. And we are convinced that such a rule will never exist. The world continuously change, markets continuously change, and any investment strategy that does not adapt to these changes will experience diminishing performance. This is the one of the few rules that has not changed. So your experience, Jerry, is that you shouldn't change too, too much, so to speak. But I guess you would agree that the rules that you were taught back then in the turtle program, despite of what these people are saying, you know, still works and is still very valid. Well, I mean, I think that the short term trend following, it does not work. Mm. And I think there's a sweet spot that works really well. And it's worked for a long, long time. It's not just curve fitted or cherry picked for the past five or 10 years. And it's to some degree, that could be a description of trend following in general. Relationships and correlations, they change. Markets change fundamentally. And my trend following entries and exits as the world changes and as the environment and economics change, fits right in and captures those trends beautifully. So that what I would sort of agree with. But I think... I agree with you. Probably what they meant is somehow as the markets are changing on a past four or five year basis, ignore your sample size requirements and just optimize to the recent data. I have a feeling that that's not a good idea, but I do think that's what clients like. Mm. So I'm not really sure if that, how much marketing that is. There was a lot of turtle jealousy and envy in that piece you just i because i may have sent you that piece actually so yes, uh, yes, there's did, a lot yeah. of stuff going on in that that i'll send to rich and brian <laughs> sure absolutely any final thoughts from you rich and brian well let me just say i think what you, what you read it was is overstated a lot mm. when i started trading 40 months years ago the academia was sure that prices were random. And mm. I talked to these people and their arguments were, were quite strange to ignore the obvious. Now, if you lose half the correlation of a trend following system or a trend following expectation, your trading after cost might get ground down pretty hard. But that's not an academic argument about trends and things changing. And although I probably believe more than most of the people we train, that things are changing. The thing you, you read there, I found to be, uh, I'll go with vastly overstated. Mm -hmm. Any final thoughts from you, Brian, before we wrap up? I would just say, you know, every, I don't know, every five, every 10 years, you're at a hedge fund conference somewhere and the question always comes up, is trend following dead? And <laughs> it's usually right after those conferences that we have good good performance so i we're going to continue doing what we do because it's it does work and even though it's it's been a a difficult number of years here we're still confident that it's going to perform well going forward 
I think on that note, let's wrap up this historic conversation about the turtle story. Rich, Brian, and Jerry, I can't thank you enough really for doing this special episode of the podcast with me today. I really appreciate your openness during our conversation. And to all our listeners around the world, let me finish by saying that I hope you're able to take a lot from today's conversation with you as you continue your own investment journey. And if you did, Please share these episodes with your friends and colleagues and send us a comment to let us know what topics you want us to bring up in the upcoming conversations with industry leaders in Managed Futures. From me, Nils Kostolarsen, and our exclusive sponsor, CME Group, thanks for listening and I look forward to being back with you on the next episode of Top Traders Roundtable. And in the meantime, go check out all the amazing free resources that you can find on cmegroup.com as well as toptradersroundtable.com. Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.